Hi, I'm Benjamin Lauder. I'm the creative director for the Center for Spirituality and Sustainability on Southern Illinois' campus at Edwardsville. It's located in a geodesic dome designed by Buckminster Fuller and his architectural partner, Shoji Sadao. They built it straddling the 90th longitudinal meridian, which also emphasizes uh, and references Fuller's Dymaxion map, which some of you may be familiar with. But it's a three-quarter geodesic dome that uh, has the continents and the oceans tinted on it with the uh, 90th meridian running down the middle of it. So when you're standing in the center of the dome and you look up, the location that you're at on the actual globe is the location that's directly above your head. So it gives you a real strong sense of your place in the world and it also gives you a vantage point of your place in the world as if you were looking out from the center of the earth. So it's difficult to describe, so you should probably go visit if you haven't already. But uh, I'm glad to speak to this group and I wanted to thank Trisha Walker for inviting me to share my experiences with um, uh, restoring some land that we had purchased back to uh, a native prairie and you know, uh, helping to uh, foster some native plant species to return to some of the land we bought. Um, since. So, you know, that's who I'll be talking to here. I love that name. Uh, Students Embracing Nature, Sustainability and the Environment is a terrific uh, name and I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm sending you these packets of seeds that we got off of uh, uh, our land here this fall when some of the flowers uh, went to seed. It's a uh, purple cone flower or echinacea and uh, shasta daisies. Um, both of them are beautiful to look at throughout the year, but uh, you know, not only that, they uh, have pretty deep uh, root systems that, that, that go down below the normal level and, and, and pull nutrients up from the lower strata of earth, so it really helps to um, rejuvenate and, and enrich the soil by reaching down deeper uh, than some of the ornamental plants that uh, we normally would put in our yard, you know, in Western culture. Uh, you know, that's another problem with using corn and soybeans, you know, in those two cash crops that they just rotate here in the Midwest, rather than, you know, having those native prairie grasses that went deeper into the soil and pulled nutrients up from, from deeper levels. Uh, the corn and soybeans are very shallow rooted plants and, you know, uh, you've probably seen farmers have to um, uh, enrich their soil every year because those those their, those roots aren't deep reaching deep in, in, in bringing those nutrients to the surface. Um, so a lot of the native plants you know that occurred here before we replaced them with corn and soybeans functioned that way. You know it was uh, they were all part of the ecosystem that worked together to you know sustain each other and en enrich each other. Um, you know, we're obviously a part of that ecosystem, even though at the present time we seem to be um, working against it. And uh, uh, I think that that can change with awareness that, uh, you know, working with rather than against the ecosystem it, uh, will be a net benefit for not only the ecosystem but us as well. Because a lot of the plants that occur here naturally and natively also have a uh, medicinal component to it, just like uh, these these two here. Uh, the purple cone flower, uh, it's a nature's antibiotic. Um, it boosts your immune system by increasing the white blood cells in your system. Uh, and the Shasta daisy, the leaves and the flowers are a medicinal portion of this plant and they're used as a fever reducer or an anti-inflammatory. They also help digestion and it works as a sedative. So with both of these, um, you use the, uh, the, the plant and uh, you can brew it into a kind of a tea. Uh, you might, you know, like we would mix it with um, some, you know, uh, spearmint or, you know, to help enhance the flavor. But with both of these, you know, the first people or the indigenous people of this area uh, were aware of the medicinal quality of the plants around us and you know that's something that uh, is our birthright that we have surrendered to corporate interests that uh, you know 
take these plant properties, take the indigenous wisdom into a laboratory, uh, uh, isolate the aspect of the plant that is causing the, uh, the, the medicinal effect and you know, synthesize that into a drug. Uh, that's obviously done for um, you know profit motive, uh, and uh, you know that's Western medicine certainly has its place and it's beneficial, especially when you find yourself you know injured. But when you're uh, you know your day to day life, when you're 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 working in in a uh, in a, in a holistic or, or you know preventative way to to keep from getting ill. Uh, living in balance with the natural environment and seeking uh, plants within your natural environment that are going to promote wellness in you is also a very um, valid way of promoting health for yourself. Um, so, you know, there's many of the plants in the landscape have a uh, medicinal quality to them. And uh, it's, you know, that, that information has been largely lost or given over to uh, corporate interests and it would be uh, you know wonderful to, to, to bring that back so I encourage everyone to you know with the internet now it's you're only limited by your desire for information you know get out there find out what your native plants are learn and uh, or research what their medicinal quality is um, when we bought this land it was a uh, it was a uh, um, hog lot and if you've ever seen a hog lot with too many hogs on it, there's not a stitch of vegetation. I mean, it's just raw dirt, and uh, you know, it was 15 acres, it was hilly, and the hogs were primarily on the high ground. So, you know, they had that uh, stripped bare. So, you know, without land without vegetation on it, whenever it rains, it causes erosion. All the topsoil had run off down into the bottom ground. The farmer who had it before us, you know, dumped all of his junk and obsolete farm equipment into the bottom ground and into the, the valley so there was you know dozens of loads of uh, tandem trucks of uh, metal and junk and various you know obsolete farm equipment that had been dumped here on this land you know over the years uh, that was the state we had found it in um, so it didn't have much growing here uh, it uh, as far as trees we were fortunate that in that bottom ground where a lot of the um, topsoil and uh, you know the fertilizer that the hogs were providing had ran down and created a pretty fertile rich bottom ground that uh, black walnut trees had grown up in so you know it's pretty desolate other than these black walnut trees uh, and you know and in figuring out what to do with land uh, I did some research and encountered this idea of permaculture uh, which was um, the that term was coined by a guy named Bill Molson who uh, you know first started doing that and uh, with the idea that permaculture mimicked the natural ecosystem as it evolved over eons and you know through human uh, intervention you would create a kind of a food forest or like a garden of eating not eating but eating uh, and you would do that by starting with your, you know, your tree, uh, you would hope to have that be a, a nut tree, which, and we were fortunate that it was black walnuts here. So that's your big canopy. And you step down from that uh, with your smaller trees, and those would be fruit trees. And then you step down and plant in the, in the drip line or the outer perimeter of the, of the, of the branches of those uh, berry bushes and you work this on down all the way to the ground level and uh, you know your vines and your your herbs and your creeping plants so this is this kind of stepping down um, all of these plants uh, evolved in that fashion in cooperation with each other uh, the you know and you I kind of had to take it on faith that Bill Molson you know and all that was correct that if you initiate that process that it will propagate itself and it will, will turn into this food forest. So we just have gotten started on it really, we've only been doing it a couple of years, but starting with those um, black walnuts and we actually had some uh, hickory nuts as well, uh, 
you know, stepping down and planting a few fruit trees. Couldn't afford a lot, but we got a few in there. And then stepping down from them and doing some uh, blackberries, raspberries, uh, and blueberries. And uh, so from just starting that point, uh, it was amazing to see all of the in-between ground start to fill in with edible plant species that we actually didn't even plant. And this occurs because the birds and animals that would be using these nuts, fruits, berries, and herbs as a food source come to your land and obviously be to, to eat what you had planted. And you know that could be aggravating if you're you know you're striving for a uh, cash crop or you know this is a business interest. But this was beneficial actually when those birds and, and, and animals come from similar areas that had edible plants. You know they're going to be seeking these little pockets in the wilderness out that has you know food supplies. So you know when they come to your land and say you know migrating birds had been you know, foraging as they move, they like to land on the edges, the outer edges of the, the limbs of the nut trees, and while they're there, they're pooping and depositing uh, berry seeds uh, that, that, that are from other areas. So, you know, when we planted the initial uh, berries, they, they got filled in around them with uh, gooseberry, two different varieties of gooseberry, uh, elderberry, uh, black cap raspberry, which are all of the different uh, native berry plants around here. And we got to benefit from the birds depositing those seeds because they were attracted to the ones, the few that we had planted. Um, another example of this was um, uh, a persimmon is a, a naturally occurring fruit tree around here. One of the very few here in central Illinois. But uh, I kept finding, uh, you know, the ra raccoons would come, and, you know, attracted to uh, apples or uh, that we had planted, and they were pooping out uh, these seeds that looked like um, almost like guitar picks, and come to find out those were persimmon seeds. And since you know I started noticing that, we have you know the tallest ones probably about 12 foot tall persimmon tree that's bearing fruit that actually becomes uh, edible and ripe this time of the year in the winter. So it's been really enlightening to see that if you just create the circumstances for this ecosystem to happen on its own, it will ultimately you know, benefit us by providing us with the food source. And you know, I, another benefit of this type of agriculture, I mean it's not agriculture, it's permaculture, um, is that when you consider acreage of, of corn and soybeans, you're only considering that really in a two-dimensional plane, that you're covering that with, um, you know, planting the corn or the soybeans. You know, a corn stalk puts off about two cobs, you know, if you're doing well. for um, you know all of that energy to expend to uh, you know you burn fuel to put the seed in and um, you know all of that effort to go forward to, to very little net gain and soybeans are, are a little bit better but again it's really a, a two-dimensional plane that you're considering with the amount of food per acre. Permaculture has a greater vertical um, uh, uh, plane of, of harvest where you know you're using uh, layers within the forest of you know you, the canopy with the nuts the lower level with the fruit the, lo the, the you know the next level with the berries all the way down to you know pumpkins or squash or whatever you have creeping across the ground so you know when a, when a nut tree is 40 feet tall um, you're you're creating a greater a vertical volume of space from which you're you're harvesting the land. So you know if you have a you know 50 you know square foot plot of permaculture versus a 50 square foot plot of corn, the amount of food 
that that land is yielding is much, much higher because of the, the verticality of permaculture. So, you know, and I probably don't have to tell you guys also that when you go promoting the native plants that, you know, you're also providing the habitat that, you know, bees and other pollinators rely on to be able to keep that ecosystem going. And, you know, our fate is uh, tied directly to the ecosystem that we evolved in that supports us. And I think, you know, our understanding of our relationship to that ecosystem is much, much deeper than any of us really realize here in the 21st century. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, you have the purple cone, cone flower. It's an antibiotic, Shasta daisy, anti-inflammatory. The first people, the indigenous people, knew this. How did they know it? Did they conduct scientific experiments and, uh, you know, replicate results in labs and do all of that? Or did they go out and they try every single plant until they hit on the one that did what they wanted? No, that's not how they did it. That's not even practical or possible. And when asked, you know, the, the medicine men or the uh, shaman of these, you know, first peoples will always say that, you know, regardless of where you are in the world, North America, South America, Africa, that the, the plant told them. And, you know, that sounds like uh, magic or some kind of goofy legend or, you know, at the very least, something that, uh, an ability that we have lost or don't understand in the 21st century. But um, we do still have that connection if we're willing to look for it. Um, and, to, and to hear these, you know, native medicine men describe how the plant told them, I mean, it wasn't with, you know, human language, but they would, if, if, if someone in the, the tribe was sick, if they have a wound, it's not healing, um, you know, they obviously, you know, in Western medicine terms, are looking for an antibiotic. Well, you know, that medicine man would set his intention and say, you know, this person who we care about has a wound and it's not healing. They would declare that to the environment around them. I need medicine. I need medicine for this. This is a good person. We love this person. We, you know, thank you, spirit, for providing us with the medicine that we're looking for. And they would, you know, venture out into the wilderness and probably fast or, you know, get their mind out of the day-to-day -day, uh, things that occupy our lives and try to get into a different plane of understanding. And eventually, out of nature, a plant would differentiate itself somehow. It would distinguish itself from the background of other plants. And in their tradition, that's when they knew that is the plant. So this is, anecdotally, this is what they say, how they say, they find medicine. The plants tell them. Nature tells them. Well, again, you know, that we don't seem to have that connection anymore. But I actually got to witness a kind of a modern day version of that that provided some validation to those legends or stories that you hear about that shamanic tradition. Uh, my wife got cancer and um, you know she was unable to continue working uh, on, ironically as a pharmaceutical sales representative which is you know providing the, the uh, laboratory distilled version of the plants to, to doctors so that they can prescribe them. Um, she, you know, was in a healing mode and uh, the thing that she ended up doing just through kind of an intuition or, you know, something that she had done as a child was to, to ease her mind to go looking for four-leaf clovers. And they just started um, jumping out and they always had for her jumping out of the background, differentiating themselves very quickly. Like, uh, you know, it was like a natural knack or a natural talent. The, the clover would just jump out at her. Um, and that was, you know, something that she'd even put 
as their occupation on Facebook now is uh, finder or four leaf clover hunter, is you know, and uh, she'd even you know started framing them and people were buying them as gifts. So it was a real thing that she was actively involved in doing, going out and hunting and finding four leaf clovers. Well, as it turns out, the uh, clovers that she was finding, uh, as far as herbal remedies go, that is the best cancer fighting herb here in the Midwest or here in this environment. Uh, so, you know, that is a quite a coincidence um, or she's actually intuitively operating within that tradition of the environment, you know, coming forward and saying this is the, this is the medicine that you're looking for, you know, this is the plant that you're looking for. Um, you know, take that however you wish. And, uh, you know, when we eliminate that habitat for ag agriculture, you know, we're losing that connection to the ecosystem. We're losing those potential medicinal plants. You know, every time we coat the acres with uh, Roundup, that, you know, the seed being planted is, you know, Roundup ready from Monsanto that, you know, you can, it can be soaked in their herbicide and is unaffected. You essentially end up with a, a monoculture on that land rather than the diverse ecosystem that provides us with sustenance and healing. Um, you know, another result of creating that monoculture is that uh, there's no food source anymore for the migrating uh, monarch butterflies here in the Midwest. Uh, their their, their uh, sole source of their, their uh, uh, life cycle is the milkweed plant. You know, they come up from Mexico to here, they stop, they deposit an egg on the young milkweed plant in the spring, uh, a caterpillar emerges from the egg and eats the milkweed and the milkweed actually has uh, a, um, a toxin in it that most plants, or I'm sorry, most insects don't eat. But because the uh, caterpillar is eating it and is immune to it, it builds it up in its system. And then when it you know, emerges from its pupa and becomes a butterfly, uh, part of the patterning on the butterfly, the monarch butterfly's wings, is a warning to potential predators that uh, says, you know, I'm toxic because it ingested as a caterpillar that toxin from the milkweed that was its sole food source that later provides its defense against predators because, you know, once they eat their first monarch and they, they find out that it is, you know, full of the toxin of the milkweed plant, they never go back to one again and they use the patterning on its leaves as, or I'm sorry, a patterning on its wings as a means of recognizing it. So, you know, there's something that we're losing as a result of creating a monoculture of agriculture. So, you know, it's not just medicine and food for us, but it's, it's an entire ecosystem of interconnected relationships that we're not separate from, that we're an integral part of. And, you know, to destroy it is to destroy ourselves. And I think that science is, is, you know, obviously come to terms with that fact, but the general population hasn't. Um, and science is providing them with the data that they need to make an intelligent decision that says, you know, we're changing our ecosystem because of our behavior of the burning of fossil fuels and the way we do industrial agriculture that system that we evolved in is no longer going to support us. Well, um, you know, the, the corporate interests that, uh, like Monsanto, that genetically engineer seeds and create Roundup Ready seeds, you know, they're stepping in like a surrogate mother nature to, to sell us what is our birthright and what we've been given. So doing things like collecting seeds, saving seeds, propagating native plant species, um, working to maintain the ecosystem that we evolved in, that we're an integral part of, that supports us, 
is a real act of rebellion within this 21st century. Um, that is where true power resides and you know your large business interests realize it that if they can be the people that provide us with our sustenance and they are the entity that has the only game in town as far as you know their genetically engineered seed is the only thing that will continue to be supported in a toxic environment if the environment becomes toxic through you know industrial chemicals pesticides fossil fuels and you know corporate interest has genetically engineered seed that will actually grow in that environment but the seed that has naturally evolved doesn't you can see that they are really in almost like a position of God at that point that um, you know they are providing us with our sustenance so this is a pivotal time this is a crucial time and organizations like sense um, are doing wonderful work I mean there's no higher cause at this time on the planet than protecting the ecosystem that supports and sustains us so you know if you have any questions that you'd like to ans ask me since you know I'm not present there today you can uh, email me at Ben Louder B E N L O W D E R at hotmail.com also you can check out uh, some diagrams I created for permaculture and some photos I posted of um, you know the results of our efforts in permaculture at benjaminlouder.com which is b-e-n-j-a-m-i-n-l-o-w-d-e-r.com so uh, you know I look forward to hearing from any of you who have any further questions and obviously this is just kind of a uh, surface glossing over of these topics but um, you know hopefully next time I can be present in the room with you and we can have a discussion around these but I you know I encourage you to email we can have that discussion virtually thank you